Um, in preparation for looking at the biblical narrative material that deals uh, specifically with the Israelites, we need to think of some or learn about some of the other critical methodologies that are used in biblical scholarship. And for a moment, we're going to adopt the role of historian. And I'm going to ask you to think like historians, whatever that might mean now and as we move into next week and look at Genesis 12 through 50. The source critical method we talked about today focuses on the hypothetical period of the compilation of the text, compilation of the four sources into the Torah. But later scholars began to ask, but what about the prehistory of those sources? What were the sources sources? Why should that be important? Remember that the source critics claimed and concluded that J, E, P, and D were written from the 10th to the 6th centuries, and the implication, well, actually not just the implication, the strong assertion of many of them was that despite the fact that they purport to tell of events prior to 1000, um, in fact, they're just not at all reliable for those periods. They were written centuries after the fact. We really can't know anything about Israel, Israel's religion, Israel's history, religious history before the 10th century. That was a very dissatisfying conclusion to many people. Because the writers of J, E, P, and D probably didn't sit down at typewriters and just invent their documents out of whole cloth. It doesn't seem that that's the way these materials would have been composed. They didn't invent, probably, all of these cultic rules and ritual practices all of a sudden. It seems likely that they were drawing on older traditions themselves, older stories, older customs, older laws, ritual practices. And so scholars in the next wave of biblical scholarship began to ask a different set of questions. They became interested in asking what materials did the compiler or the compilers of J or E or P draw on in the composition of those sources? Did they use more ancient materials? And if so, can we figure out what they were? And do they contain reliable traditions from, for an earlier stage? And if so, then maybe we do have access, after all, to information regarding Israelite history prior to the year 1000. And so suddenly you see an, an analytical approach to the Bible that's going to pull in the exact opposite direction from the classical source theory. And one of the leading scholars to take up this question was Hermann Gunkel, whose name is at the top over there. Gunkel had a great knowledge of the oral literature of other cultures, other nations, and that led him to ask, can we perhaps analyze these four literary source documents and figure out the pre-literary stages of their development? What went into their compilation and composition? And he found support for this idea within the Bible itself, because at times the Bible seems to name earlier sources quite explicitly. We don't have records of those sources anymore, but they seem to be named in the Bible. In Numbers 21, 14, there's a little poetic excerpt that gives the boundaries between uh, Moab and the Amorites. And it's quoted, and it's, it's quoted, and it says it's from the book of the wars of the Lord. And it's quoted as if this is a source that the person is drawing on and using in the composition of his text. And it's, it's quoted in a way that makes it sound as if the source should be familiar to the reader. Um, we also have mention of something called the book of Yashar, in Joshua, that's also quoted, Joshua 10, 13, or in, Sa in 2 Samuel 1, uh, 18, we have David uh, lamenting, a very beautiful lament over the death of Saul and his beloved Jonathan. And it seems to actually be an epic song that recounts acts of Israel's heroes, and he's reciting that now as he laments over the death of these two. Um, and so it seems to be an earlier source that's been put into the story of David and his lament. So it seems reasonable in light of the practices of other people, other ancient cultures and literatures, as well as some contemporary uh, literatures. And it seems reasonable in light of the explicit citation of sources in the biblical text to suppose that, in fact, the four primary documents are themselves compilations from other source materials or drawing on written or oral material from an even earlier period. So Gunkel began to focus on these on small little units. He was interested in small units within the, the four primary documents, and he identified genres or forms, what he called forms. The German word is a Gattung, Gattung, forms. He would identify these small units, and that gave uh, rise to the name of this approach, which is form criticism. He believed that what he was doing was identifying older pre-literary forms that had been taken up and incorporated by the literary sources, by J, E, P, and D. Examples of the kinds of forms, a gatung, um, that he would identify were things like 
a hymn, a proverb. We also often have biblical texts quoting proverbs that seem to be folk sayings, um, laws, rituals, folk stories of a particular type, poems, legends, um, songs, fragments of mythology. So, for example, he says of Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4, a passage that you've read, when men began to increase on earth and daughters were born to them, the divine beings saw how beautiful the daughters of men were and took wives from among them that pleased them. The Lord said, My breath shall not abide in man forever, since he too is flesh. Let the days allowed to him be 120 years. It was then and later too that the Nephilim, these giants of some kind, appeared on earth when the divine beings cohabited with the daughters of men who bore them offspring, these, these giants, these Nephilim, and they were the heroes of old, the men of renown. And it's, it's just stuck in there in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. He says this, this is an older uh, fragment of a mythology or a legend which is put into place here. It's explaining the origin of, of heroes and great men of renown in, in the old days. He also says that there are etiological stories. We've talked about those legends that give the origin of a name or a ritual or an institution. There are different types of etiological stories. He says there are ethnological legends that will give you the story accounting for the origin of a particular people. So the Moabites, for example, and the Ammonites, not a flattering story at all, um, following uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Obviously, the Israelites didn't care for those people very much and gave them a pretty nasty uh, origin. Um, we also have... Um, Etymological legends, because they're explaining the name of something. It's given this particular name because of an etymological connection with some event um, earlier. So all of these things, he argues, are probably older existing traditions that have been taken up and adapted by the biblical writer, and they may preserve some historical reminiscence. More importantly, more important than the actual events that they might be reporting, is the fact that behind each of these is some sort of function. Each one of these did some sort of cultural work. It had some function or setting in life. And that's what we can discover when we isolate these forms, this setting in life. And that helps us learn something about ancient Israelite society or culture way before the 10th century. That's Gunkel's claim. So form criticism wasn't content with just identifying these various types of material, these various genres. It asked, what was their function? What was their Sitzimleben? What was their situation in life? Their cultural context? What does it tell us that we have a large number of liturgical texts? What does it tell us that we have a large number of texts that seem to point to some sort of judicial context? What does it tell us that we have a great deal of proverbs or sort of wisdom material in certain parts of the Bible that we might date to a certain time? What does this tell us about society and what people were doing? Growing out of form criticism is tradition criticism. And, uh, this is a, a type of criticism that focuses on the transmission of traditional material through various stages, oral stages and literary stages, until it reaches its present form in the text. Now, you can imagine, as a story is told and then it's retold, it is obviously changed and adapted. Um, tradition criticism looks at that looking at ancient Near Eastern parallels are very helpful. You can see how some of those motifs and themes were changed right, in the, in the process of being transmitted within Israelite culture and society, uh, and again, to serve some sort of cultural function or purpose. So the present text of the Pentateuch obviously rests on a very, very long period of transmission, both oral, oral recitation and transmission, very much like the Greek classics, Homer's classics, the Odyssey, the Iliad, they also had a long history of oral recitation and transmission and were transformed along the way. And tradition criticism likes to look at the way people receive traditional material, uh, rework it in creative ways, and then adapt it to their own purposes and context and transmit it. Sometimes that process is reflected in the Bible itself. Um, traditions in one part of the Bible will be picked up in a later part of the Bible and written rather differently with a different point of view. So Deuteronomy, for example, recounts events that we've also read about in Exodus. And sometimes the differences are startling. Sometimes there are completely new emphases. Uh, and the story can come out in, 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 to, to be a very, very different story. Uh, First and Second Chronicles are a retelling and a reworking of much of the material from Genesis through Second Kings. And it tells that uh, it, it cleans up a lot of the embarrassing moments. Um, it presses its own themes um, in retelling those stories. Early laws are subject to reinterpretation. 
Ezekiel comes along and does some interesting things with some of the, the legal material that we find in Leviticus. Um, this is all the kind of thing that tradition criticism looks at. Tradition criticism wants to uncover the changes that occur in the transmission of traditional material. It's already happening. We can see it within the Bible, and the assumption, therefore, is that it happens before the material even gets into the Bible. Perhaps we can figure some of that out. And it's a process that also aids in historical reconstruction. So you can see, after classic source criticism, which came along and sort of you know, leveled people's interest in anything before the 10th century, and said all we have are these written accounts that reflect the biases of the people at the time who wrote them, you then have a rise of, of, of types of scholarship that say we're not satisfied with that. That's not really how literature works. People don't sit down and invent things out of whole cloth, particularly material of this type. It clearly has a history. They're clearly drawing on sources. And maybe we can use analytical tools to figure out something about the period um, that you might think would be lost to history. So these types of criticism are emphasizing the real life historical setting of the materials that are in the biblical sources, their relationship to the wider culture. That's something that earlier source criticism didn't care too much about. All of these analytical modes of studying the Bible, by analytical I mean sitting down and analyzing the features, the literary features of the text and drawing conclusions from them. All of these modes of examining the Bible, most of them developed by German scholars, can be contrasted with a North American tradition of scholarship which emphasized um, the correlation of biblical and archaeological data. I've written the name um, Albright, William F. Albright was a leading scholar of the American School of Biblical Studies, and he was an expert in the fields of Palestinian archaeology and Assyriology. He focused on illustrating the Bible with the ancient Near Eastern sources that at that time were, were newly coming to light, archaeological findings, and his argument was, and it's an argument that's to a large degree not accepted anymore, but his argument at the time was that archaeology supported the basic historicity of biblical tradition. And there are some definite problems, however, with viewing the Bible as history. Um, there are certainly problems with chronology. It's hard to pin down dates on a lot of things. Many of the events were given more than one date. A lot of the numbers, the Bible tends to use ideal numbers. It tends to use fives and multiples of fives or multiples of five plus seven. Um, you have ten generations from Adam to Noah. You have ten generations from Noah to Abram. These things begin to raise suspicions. We have suspicious repetitions of events, things that happen to two or more of the patriarchs. Twice Abraham goes into foreign territory and tries to pass his wife off as his sister. Isaac does the same thing. Are these three versions of one basic tradition that got assigned to different patriarchs? Are we supposed to think of these as representing three separate historical incidents? What's the likelihood of these things happening? Is that historically reasonable? So there are lots of reasons to feel that biblical chronologies of the patriarchal period are not accurate historical records. I use that phrase with uh, some timidity. But in the 20th century, scholars of Albright's school argued that many of the traditions in the book of Genesis contained authentic reflections of the historical period they claimed to deal with. And they cited a number of considerations. So we'll take those up on Monday, but I would like you, as you read Genesis 12 and forward and think about that material, I'd like you to ask yourself, um, is this historical writing? By what criteria do I judge historical writing? What do I think historical writing is? What makes some writing historical? What makes other writing fictional? Where do we get these genres from? Why is it so important to us to figure out what this is? Think about some of those issues, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we turn to the text in Genesis 12. <clears throat> 